My name is Annie and I am a West Central Regional Navigator out of a nonprofit organization called Someplace Safe here in West Central Minnesota. I have worked in the anti trafficking field for about five years now. Um, and prior to that, I worked in tribal child protection and in victim advocacy. Um, I am Indigenous. I uh, grew up on the Fond du Lac Reservation and my family is from White Earth. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you all about um, understanding how trafficking impacts Indigenous people and how to connect clients to community and culture. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to get started. Oh, and I guess I would also encourage you all to, uh, as I go through this presentation today, um, please drop any questions that you may have in the chat. I'm super excited to hear uh, thoughts and feedback. So, let's see how to make this move. <laughs> Sorry, this is my first time in Webex, so I just want to be sure I'm getting it right. Um, let's see. So, I wanted to start out first and foremost today just talking very briefly about a land acknowledgement. And I want to acknowledge again, as today is Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, that we are currently residing on the ancestral homelands of many different indigenous tribes, um, mainly Ocheti, Shakawan, Dakota Band. Um, but we also are residing in a place where multiple different tribal people um, continue to live and thrive from multiple different tribal backgrounds. So we know that there are folks from Anishinaabe tribes, um, White Earth, Red Lake, Leech Lake, um, also from Turtle Mountain, we also know that there are Dakota folks from Sisseton, Wabaton, Oyate, um, Spirit Lake, and then there are also Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara, and so many other tribal folks who are living in, in this place that is now called Fargo and Moorhead. Um, if you are interested, I actually was able to get information on the folks or the, the tribal um, tribes who resided here before from this really awesome website, and I'm going to actually put it in the chat right now. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, it's called native-land.ca. So you can find out more about whose land we occupy um, and who is currently, you know, here where we're residing. So we honor with gratitude Mother Earth and the Indigenous peoples who have walked with her through generations. And um, without any further ado, I will talk to you a little bit more about trafficking. So I like to start out my trainings just talking first and foremost about what specifically um, human trafficking is. And today, because we are gonna be talking about some more in depth things, I really wanna talk first of all about kind of the risk factors behind trafficking. Um, and uh, starting out with just kind of an basic overview. So when we're talking about human trafficking, what we're really seeing is somebody who's in a position of power, who's taking advantage of someone else's vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities can include, but really aren't limited to age, low self-esteem, substance abuse, a separation maybe from family or their core support, um, living in poverty, um, having mental health concerns, um, both short-term and long-term, folks with both seen and unseen disabilities. Um, and I have money here, so either people who don't have money or people who don't have access to money or who want more material goods. Um, and then we also uh, see these links in family life, and that can look like a lot of different things, right? So it could be family, family members who have engaged in... Um, trafficking, who have been victims of trafficking, or who have engaged in survival sex. And um, then we also see really very commonly this previous sexual abuse or overall general neglect in folks who have experienced trafficking. And then we're also seeing a lot of homelessness and couch shopping. So essentially there are folks who have one or more vulnerabilities who are being taken advantage of somebody who's seeing those vulnerabilities and exploiting them for something of value. So when we talk about these risk factors, again, in the work that I've done um, and those others in the human trafficking field, we see that there are some risk factors that are more common specifically in trafficking. Um, and, and again, more commonly in specifically sex trafficking. So one of 
some of these risk factors that we're seeing is this experience of childhood sexual abuse um, or even poly victimization. And what that means is not only has this person experienced at least one incidence of childhood sexual abuse or one perpetrator of childhood sexual abuse, but there may be having multiple different folks who have abused them or they're being sexually abused by one person and they may, may be um, experiencing emotional neglect or physical neglect in another circumstance. Um, a lot of times we're also seeing folks who are experiencing mental health crises. Um, they may be using or dealing with chemical dependency. And this is something that is very closely linked with trafficking. And we we see every situation is different. So it sometimes is that someone has um, substance abuse already and they're targeted by a trafficker or conversely, they may be somebody who is being trafficked and they weren't initially using substances, but they start using and become addicted to substances really just to deal with the trauma of what they're experiencing. Um, they may be having, as I mentioned, either phys physical or cognitive disabilities. Um, unfortunately, this risk factor of being a child or youth, and I like to, I joke about this, um, but it's true is that, you know, just the simple act of being young is a vulnerability because we know, and I, I laugh, and I don't honestly think this is true, but when I talk about this with providers, especially like I talk about kids being stupid um, and kids aren't really truly stupid, but uh, brain development doesn't stop until the age of 25. And so we know that particularly with young teenagers, um, they're engaging in a lot of really risky behavior and they're not necessarily seeing um, how this risky behavior may lead to um, potential consequences. Um, so they're really not understanding what could happen if they meet with a stranger that they've been talking to online, or they don't know what different consequences might happen if they run away, or if they get into a car with a stranger or um, an older man. So just this, this um, inability to really see how potentially risky behaviors can end up with something dangerous happening. So kids aren't stupid, but they do definitely engage in some unsafe and maybe not super smart behaviors. Um, unfortunately, we also know that folks who are black, indigenous, Latinx, or are other people of color experience sex trafficking and labor trafficking at significantly higher rates. And there are a lot of things that really tie into the causes behind that. And today I'm gonna talk specifically more about how indigenous people are impacted by trafficking and exploitation. Um, but if this is something you're interested in, please feel free to reach out to me. I can connect you with more resources. We can talk through it. But really essentially what's happening is that um, people of color often come from resource deprived communities and we're seeing these lack of resources as things that traffickers and exploiters are definitely exploiting and taking advantage of. Um, again, as I'd mentioned, folks who are experiencing homelessness or unstable or unsafe housing are experiencing trafficking at higher rates. Um, I just came back from a conference in Atlanta, Georgia, and we talked about uh, this homelessness and this link to uh, trafficking specifically here in North Dakota and Minnesota. And now I'm talking to you all, and I'm assuming you're all in this kind of region with me, where I say if a 14 year old runs away from a unsafe home situation in the middle of January in Minnesota or North Dakota, sometimes they feel like they have to engage in survival sex in order to survive, right? So it's their choice is either to have sex with a stranger in a warm place to stay or freeze to death overnight. In Atlanta, we said that and the, you know, the people looked at us like, what? <laughs> freeze to death in Atlanta, that never happens. But I think each of us can imagine here in Minnesota how a young person or even an older person might feel like in a certain situation that they have no other option that in order to find a safe place to stay, in order to get something to eat, um, they may feel like they're forced to have sex with, a, with someone. Um, we also see that folks who identify as lesbian, gay, and bisexual are experiencing trafficking at significantly higher rates, as well as our transgender and gender non-conforming youth and adults. And I have some, some data really to show specifically what we're seeing in Minnesota about this as well with indigenous youth, but we do know really across the board transgender youth are experiencing trans sorry transgender youth and adults experience trafficking and exploitation at higher rates than any other population. We know that folks who are undocumented are at higher risk for trafficking, and then this involvement with criminal legal system, probation, and social services, and that's really tied into 
um, that experience of childhood, se childhood sexual abuse, childhood physical abuse, and other types of neglect. Um, and then finally, those who are experiencing poverty. And as I had mentioned, when we talk about homelessness, unstable or unsafe housing, really these things all tie together, right? So if you don't have a lot of options or what feel like a lot of options, um, we see higher rates of trafficking and exploitation. And that holds true across the state of Minnesota as well, um, particularly in something called the Minnesota Student Survey. We saw that the highest rates for youth who are experiencing sexual exploitation or youth who reported having traded sex for something of value didn't reside in the Twin Cities or metro area like a lot of people thought that they might. In fact, the youth who are experiencing the highest rates of exploitation who are trading sex with somebody um, for a place to stay or a ride, um, food, other things like that are actually youth who are residing in rural Minnesota. So really that idea of not having basic needs met, not having a lot of resources, um, not having a lot of options is very highly tied into trafficking and exploitation. Uh, so we do know there are specific vulnerabilities that are impacted by historical trauma and systemic oppression. So things that native individuals and native communities are experiencing that make us at higher risk to be trafficked and exploited. And those include um, a loss of cultural identity. Um, so we know that historical trauma, uh, systemic oppression really has taken a lot of tribal values from a lot of tribal communities and from tribal families through many different things, such as the boarding schools, um, forced relocation, um, different attempts of assimilation. So we know, again, <clears throat> that loss of cultural identity, um, maybe we're not speaking the language, maybe we're no longer residing in a tribal community or we're residing somewhere where there aren't a large population of other Native Americans. Um, all of those different things really uh, lead to vulnerability of trafficking. On this two-spirit identity, as I had mentioned previously, uh, both youth and adults who ident identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, and queer experience higher rates of trafficking and exploitation. And the same goes for those who, who identify as two-spirit. And that ties into a lot of different things. So um, we see in some families when a youth identifies as LGBTQ plus or two-spirit, they may not have support from their family members. They may be forced to... Um, leave their home early. Um, they may be in, in an environment, in a home environment where they are um, made to feel less than or made to feel unimportant or discriminated against or even harmed because of this identity. Or conversely, they may be experiencing that discrimination or harm within their communities. Um, so this identity puts people at higher risk for harm, which puts people at higher risk for exploitation and trafficking. We also know that Native Americans experience higher rates of sexual violence than any other race in the United States. Um, this is true for both Native women and for Native men. Um, so I am on the board of an organization called Mending the Sacred Hoop or Sacred Hoop Coalition, which is a national um, tribal technical assistance program for domestic tribal domestic violence programs across the United States. And at one conference, we talked about most recently, data shows that Native American women are experiencing sexual violence at rates of about 50%. So that equals one in two Native women will be sexually abused or sexually assaulted at some point in their life. However, at this conference, um, which was domestic violence and sexual assault victim service providers from tribes across the United States, um, in, in talking about what we were seeing in each of these communities, what it looked like was more then one in two Native women are experiencing sexual violence. Really what we're, we're seeing in all of our communities across the United States is that most commonly it's somewhere up to 90%. So almost every single Native woman at some point in their life is going to experience sexual violence. And that unfortunately puts us at significantly higher risk for being exploited and taken advantage of. Um, we also see this systems involvement, um, and I had talked previously about how this disconnection from our family or core support can lead to trafficking or exploitation. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, being connect, um, losing this connection to your family, um, close family or extended family or communities that care about us um, cause 
many different feelings, isolation, uh, low self-esteem, all of those different things. And unfortunately that happens a lot through systems involvement. And we do see higher rates of systems involvement for native youth. I will talk a little bit more about this um, further down today as well, um, but that's another vulnerability that happens specifically to native individuals due to these um, systemic oppression. And then we're also seeing a lack of access to cultural activities and healing methods and that can be on reservation. We can have um, individuals who don't feel comfortable attending these different resources due to their victimization or due to their perpetrator. Um, or conversely, they may be not living in on reservations. They may not be living in urban areas that have access to these different resources. Um, so many different things coming together for that lack of access. Um, they may have a lack of access to role models. They may be living in communities that have high rates of gang activity. And again, we see gang activity is um, often very tied into human trafficking, either because they're involved um, or it's a part of the gang activity or it's that normalization of violence within the community. And we also see jurisdictional issues. Um, so we know that when crimes occur on tribal communities, there may be any number of different law enforcement um, agencies that may or may not respond. Uh, and we know that it, it's very complicated. And we also know that human traffickers, um, exploiters, perpetrators know that these jurisdictional issues exist. Uh, and, and we know that they seek out uh, victims from reservations because of these issues. And then finally, we have this distrust of systems. Um, so we have Native individuals, Native families, and Native communities who have been let down by multiple different systems for many generations. And so this, this lack of trust for these different systems that sometimes may come in and be uh, protective of us, we're less willing to engage with them, which also puts at a, us at higher risk be, to be taken advantage of. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, specific vulnerabilities that we're seeing both in Minnesota and North Dakota. And just to kind of highlight a little bit of information on each of these. So I had mentioned um, in one of the risk factor slides that we see poverty and homelessness as some large risk factors or vulnerabilities for trafficking. So we know that in Minnesota, Native Americans experience higher rates of poverty, um, higher rates locally than nationally. So one in three native adults and youth in the state of Minnesota are living in poverty. Uh, and this is actually really a large contrast to poverty rates of white Minnesotans. So less than one in 10 white Minnesotans live in poverty. Um, and we also see that our native Americans are experiencing homelessness at, homelessness at rates that are actually 26 times higher specifically in Minnesota than white Minnesotans. And of those natives who are experiencing homelessness in our state, three fourths, 75% of them actually have gainful employment, right? So they're working, but they still cannot afford um, a place to stay. And of those folks, native folks specifically in the state of Minnesota who are experiencing homelessness, almost half of them are under the age of 18. Um, so we're seeing, particularly among Native youth, that high risk of um, trafficking and exploitation, um, again, experiencing these high rates of homelessness. So in terms of victimization, um, we know that Native Americans experience higher rates of all types of victimization. So not just sexual assault or sexual abuse, but also intimate partner violence and also stalking. We see that uh, Native lifetime rates of violence really across the board for Native women and men are at 80%. So 8 in 10 Native Americans have experienced some form of violence in their life. Um, and again, we know that for Native women, what we've seen an anecdotally at least is significantly higher than that even. And um, these uh, national rates, as I had shared, are significantly higher. As in terms of stalking, which we know is um, directly correlated with intimate partner homicide, nearly one in two Native women have been stalked at some point in their life. So 50% of Native women have experienced some form of stalking, which also ties into the high rates of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, and we also know that certain types of victimization are correlated with human trafficking. So for example, 
there was a study done in Minneapolis called the Garden of Truth, which found that Native women who were being sexually exploited or trafficked in Minnesota, um, almost 80% of them had experienced childhood sexual abuse with an average of four separate perpetrators. And so then we know with this average that some had experienced fewer than four perpetrators, but some had experienced significantly more. So these high rates of sexual abuse are very, very closely tied into higher rates of trafficking. So in terms of child welfare representation, um, most recent reports are showing that one in four minors, so anyone under the age of 18 in placement in Minnesota are Native American. And this is this number is important because that shows us, okay, so 25% of our kids in placement right now are Indigenous, but only 2% of our state population are Indigenous people, or one in 50. So one in four youth in placement are Native American, while one in 50 of us across the population are Native American. So we know that those rates are not representative of the actual population, right? Um, so we see also in, in Minnesota that Native families are more likely to have investigations opened through child protection, reports of abuse substantiated, and end up in foster care placement than Native American families across the United States. These national, national rates of placement um, substantiation and investigation on reports are significantly lower than they are on families in our state. And we also know that in our state, particularly Native children, are more likely to be reported and identified as victims of maltreatment and are also more likely to enter in and stay in care than our white peers. So now that I've talked about Minnesota, I would like to just kind of share similar information about what we're seeing in North Dakota in terms of these vulnerabilities. We also see higher rates of poverty with Native Americans in North Dakota than nationwide, with nearly 50% of Native children in North Dakota experiencing poverty, which is a rate that's five times higher than the national average. We also see rates of homelessness increasing for Native Americans in North Dakota. So as of 2019, 30% of North Dakotans, almost one in three, identify as Native American, which is a significant increase from 2017 even. So we're experiencing um, homelessness in North Dakota at increasingly higher rates. So again, as I had mentioned before, why is this important when we're talking about trafficking? Um, it's easier to find yourself in an exploitive situation when you don't have the financial means uh, to make ends meet. We also know, as I had mentioned, um, talking about these rates of victimization being higher. Um, I, I've already shared this information. The, these rates of victimization are the same in North Dakota as well. So these higher rates of sexual exploitation, higher rates of um, sexual abuse, higher rates of violence correlate in North Dakota as they do in Minnesota. Um, so in terms of child welfare representation, we're seeing one in three children in foster care are Native American. And um, we're also seeing higher rates of child maltreatment reports coming into North Dakota as or to North Dakota Department of Human Services as well. So we see that in North Dakota, Native children are more likely to be reported and identified as victims of maltreatment and are also more likely to enter into care than their white peers. So these numbers really um, what we're seeing from these numbers is children in foster care are at higher risk for trafficking and exploitation. And this is something that we see again anecdotally. And this is also something that I've seen in the work that I do. So I, as I mentioned, I've been in the human trafficking field specifically for five years and I was in child protection prior to that. And um, so I work in Minnesota and we're funded through something called the Safe Harbor Program. And I was trained in through Safe Harbor in 2016 as a um, child protection worker. And at that point, as I, I sat in this training with uh, a number of my colleagues and people that I worked with, and we were listening to professionals talk about what does trafficking look like? Um, what is exploitation? Who's at risk for it? Um, what, what do we do? And as we were listening to all of the different um, risk factors, signs, red flags, um, identifiers of trafficking, myself and my colleagues were looking at each other and we were like, just like listing off 
back and forth between each other, all of the kids that were on our caseload that were being sex trafficked, all of the kids that were on our caseload that had been sex trafficked, and then all of the parents on our caseload that had either been trafficked themselves, um, parents being trafficked by significant others, um, or parents that were trafficking their kids. Um, so just we, to that point, didn't have the language or identifiers to be able to talk about what this was. Um, we all knew that obviously these were situations that were not safe or healthy and that these um, families needed support and help, but we we weren't able to say like, this is what's actually happening. So it was kind of this, this like, like jaw dropping, eye opening moment to think about like, wow, holy smokes, this is, this is what's happening with the people that we're serving. Um, and we're also able to see how many of these factors really led to these situations that these families were experiencing. Um, so again, as I had mentioned before, the social isolation for many youth who are placed in foster care, um, they're often not placed in their home communities. There is unfortunately, um, a lack of foster parents in every community. And so unfortunately, sometimes youth are moved to homes that are 30 minutes away, 40 minutes, hour or further. So they may not be able to attend the same schools that they were attending beforehand. So not only are they no longer seeing their parents and sometimes their siblings, but they're not seeing other people who care about them on a daily basis, whether that be a sports coach, um, whether that be maybe their math teacher or their English teacher, maybe it's, um, the, the person sitting at the front desk at their school, maybe it's their neighbor, maybe it's the person driving the bus, but they no longer have access to this large community of folks who love and care about them. They also have less social and family support. So in addition to the folks that I already mentioned, um, in addition to not seeing their parents um, or talking to their parents on a regular daily basis, they're also not seeing their aunties, their uncles, their grandparents. Um, they may go from seeing these people on a daily or weekly basis to having one hour of supervised visitation or a 20 minute phone call with them once a month. So they're really feeling alone and unable to talk to and connect with the people that love and care about them. And we also see high rates of transient formal support. Um, child protection is really hard work. It's really difficult and there's high rates of turnover. So. Um, they're not connecting with social workers because they may be experiencing multiple different social workers. They may have a new social worker every year. They may have a so new social worker every six months. Um, so they may not get close to any formal supports in their life. Or conversely, if they're um, being moved from foster home to foster home, they may not have um, foster parents that they're able to connect to, or they may not be able to continue to access other types of formal support like counseling, mentoring, and other things from the same sources due to moving around. We also know that just with the simple act of removal being traumatic, that they have higher rates of mental health diagnoses. So these mental health diagnoses, as I would mentioned earlier, really are tied into trafficking and exploitation because traffickers identify these vulnerabilities and they really play into them. So um, whether it's somebody who is feeling lonely, um, whether it's somebody who's feeling like nobody cares about them or that they have no one to talk to, our traffickers are looking for that and they're really playing into that. So telling um, our youth and our victims, I do care about you, I love you, how you feel is important to me and really validif validifying, validating, so you <laughs> just made up a word there, validating these, these feelings um, and taking advantage of that. Um, but we know again for youth who end up in foster care, typically, the trauma that they're experiencing isn't just the act of removal, right? There's probably things that are happening in the home beforehand that are leading to these higher rates of mental health diagnoses, whether it's parent substance abuse, um, parent domestic violence, um, community violence, all of these different things that are impacting youth before they're removed. We also see children that are between the ages of 12 and 17 being overrepresented in foster care. And unfortunately, the longer someone's in foster care, the more amounts of placement they're in. Um, I share a, a couple of different stories about youth that I've worked with through the years. Um, one of whom was, oh gosh, this, I, it's, it's sad to see. Um, when I met a family and worked with them, the oldest child at that point was 13 years old. And the first time that they were in placement was when they were eight months old. 
And by the time I encountered them at 13 years old, they had been in 33 separate foster homes and um, had been reunified with their parent on two separate occasions. At, at this point, it was their third occasion of reunification. But um, in those 33 separate homes, they were sometimes placed with their younger siblings, sometimes not placed with their younger siblings. Um, in more than one foster home, they could, they could tell me, describe to me um, where they witnessed their younger siblings being sexually abused by foster parents. Um, so all of these different really traumatic things that were happening to them, not only in their their biological home with their biological family, but also in these foster homes. So, uh, you know, the more time and care, more placements and, and the less connection to people that care about us and also the more traumatic incidences, right? Um, and then, of course, as I don't know that it even needs mentioning, but I'm going to say it anyways, this, this less connection to the people around us that care about us also means that we have less access for these youth to culture in their home community. It might be again a outing once a year with the foster family to a powwow where they're with a, a foster family that may not be native and may not really understand anything about um, culture or the things that are happening at the powwow, but they're able to, you know, take them, get them a fry bread taco, uh, maybe some earrings and sit down and watch dancing for 20 minutes. That That doesn't give the same kind of cultural connection that um, perhaps a native foster parent might be able to give. So we're seeing these lower amounts of access to the things that are really important that are also really healing for us. So I just wanted to talk for a moment about, as I had mentioned earlier, um, experiencing higher rates of vulnerabilities. Um, what does what do the actual demographics look like? So who is actually experiencing human trafficking, first and foremost, in Minnesota first, and secondly, in North Dakota, I guess, for least in North Dakota is what we're looking at here. Um, so we're seeing, again, just to talk about breakdown, I believe the last I looked, in terms of population, 5% of North Dakotans identify as Indigenous or Native American. And we're seeing, in terms of who's actually being see, seen and served by the North Dakota Human Trafficking Task Force, as of March 31st, 2021, 24% or almost one in four clients were Native American or Alaska Native. Um, so again, we're seeing these high rates um, that are very disproportionate to actual population of folks experiencing trafficking and exploitation. So we're also seeing these um, numbers for biracial or multiracial uh, and then about half or a little less than half are white or Caucasian. Uh, in Minnesota, we're also seeing similar levels. Um, so what we've seen in terms of rates of sex trafficking is, um, so we, we don't have an annual report. Our most recent report was in 2018, and we saw that pretty much the same, 23% of those who are served by service providers um, and identified as having been sex trafficked, 23% were Native American. So in North Dakota, 24%, in Minnesota, 23%. Uh, again, just kind of to note, um, North Dakota's overall population of Native Americans is higher than Minnesota, so still disproportionate here. Um, we're seeing lower rates specifically of labor trafficking, but that's something that we see lower rates across the state of Minnesota in general because our um, outreach and um, response to labor trafficking still needs a lot of work. Uh, we also, again, are seeing higher rates or higher levels of reporting to child protection as having been sex trafficked. So higher levels of native youth are being reported as having experienced sex trafficking, which aligns with what I saw in my own personal work. Um, they're significantly higher likelihood to be reported as a victim of trafficking or exploitation than white youth. Um, and more likely to be, um, so here we're seeing reports that are screened in or, or, or given to child protection, about 10% involve youth who are eligible for ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act, which means that about one in 10 reports, including um, sex trafficking, were native youth, which again, as we see, one in 50 actual children in the state of Minnesota are Native American. So those numbers are very disproportionate. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have something called the Minnesota Student Survey. So in 2019, the Minnesota Student Survey, which is um, a survey that's sent out to all public 
school students across the state, um, specifically on health and well being. And there, there are like hundreds of questions um, asking about substance abuse, asking about um, mental health and well being, asking about school involvement, school participation, really just kind of across the board. They added a question in 2019, as I mentioned, specifically on sexual exploitation. So whether or not somebody was trading sex for something of value. And this is the information on what native youth reported. So we see in terms of youth who answered yes, and this re represents about 80% of all public school students in 2019, um, native students were the most likely, or the, or the highest by race to answer yes to having traded sex for something of value. Um, so this, again, of course, aligns with what we've seen so far. Um, interestingly enough, though, we're seeing in Native American youth, these certain background experiences put them at even higher risk or highly higher likelihood of having um, traded sex for something of value or, as we call in the field, having been sexually exploited. So higher rates um, of sexual exploitation, particularly for Indigenous youth who have been in foster care. And as we talk about now, one in four Native youth are currently uh, or one in four youth in foster care are native of those one in four youth. Um, one in 10 of them have experienced sexual exploitation. And I think it's really important to note when we talk about this, uh, the Minnesota student survey, this question was answered by ninth graders and 11th graders. We know that dropout rates among indigenous youth are higher than other populations. And we also know for native youth or all youth who are experiencing sex sexual exploitation or sex trafficking, they are less likely to be in school for a myriad of different reasons. So we are pretty certain that these numbers are lower even than what's actually accurate. Um, but we're also seeing in addition to these higher rates of native youth having been sexually exploited in foster care, we're also seeing, again, as I had mentioned before, unstable housing or homelessness. And we also see this food insecurity. So their families aren't able to meet their basic needs and to keep them fed on a regular basis. Um, and then also, uh, higher rates for those who get free or reduced lunch at school. So it's what I'm showing with all of these numbers really is that there are a myriad of societal and community factors that lead to the trafficking and exploitation of these indigenous youth. And then, as I had mentioned before, higher rates of um, exploitation, particularly among our um, gender uh, gender, those who have unsure gender identity and for those who are transgender. And so for all students, we see highest rates at 5.9% for transgender um, and for native students, those who identify as transgender significantly higher rates of exploitation. Um, and, and this is just another breakdown of what it looks like. Um, so interestingly enough, we also see that there are higher rates of, um, oops, didn't mean to press that, high rates of exploitation, particularly uh, among Native boys, too, which is uh, not what a lot of providers would identify, but very, very high rates. So one in three almost Native youth who are experiencing exploitation identify as male. So what can we do? When, now that we see all of this data, now that we've talked about kind of these risk factors, um, what are some things that we can do as individuals, as providers, as community members to really promote resilience in our native clients, in our native um, youth, maybe their native youth in our family, uh, or maybe in our community. So first I wanna just share what is resilience, um, which probably all of you know, but I really like to share it because it's it's good to see what we want to, to have happen. And resilience is the process of adapting while in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. Um, so it's important to keep resilience in mind when we're working with Native clients and when we're talking about Native individuals. So we as Native Americans and First Nations people have survived over 500 years of colonization and federally sponsored cultural genocide. Um, we have persisted through these efforts and continue to carry knowledge about culture and traditional ways of living. And our existence and presence today is a testament to the strength and resilience of our ancestors. So first and foremost, I want to talk about what's needed. So what do we need? Um, native families and youth 
need access to safe spaces where we can participate in cultural activities without judgment. Um, so these spaces should be allowing access to elder wisdom, cultural engagement, and opportunities for positive youth development. So these programs help Native youth develop positive self-identities -identi with better understanding of the strength and resilience inherent in our Indigenous communities. And it's important for youth in all areas of both of our states to have access to this. Um, I kind of like wax poetic about how uh, when, well, when a lot of people who are non-Indigenous think about Indigenous people, we think about them in terms of their existence on a reservation. That's actually like super inaccurate. Um, so in Minnesota, 80% uh, of Native Americans don't live on the reservation. And in North Dakota, I believe it's 50%. So we need access to these kinds of things because we're not just existing on the reservation. We're existing in every community. We live in urban areas. We live in the metro, as I mentioned, we live in mid-sized cities and we live in small towns. Um, so every community can do something to uphold and uplift native identity. Um, we also need to have uh, providers who are well-educated in the nuances of tribal identity, how systemic oppression and historical trauma have impacted and continue to impact Indigenous families and our cultural identity, and then also how to best support and stand beside us. And um, I have bad news for you guys. <laughs> this is not achieved through a one-time training, but it really has to happen through regular engagement with tribal communities. So super cool that you're here today on Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and for those of you who are able to attend our opening ceremony earlier today, it was stated, um, every day is Indigenous Peoples Day. You can do something every day to learn more about Native people, the Native people in your community, the Native people across Turtle Island, um, and, and uphold and uplift us. So, um, and that also includes um, ensuring that our organizations, our programs are hiring Native service providers, and we're also listening to the needs of Native families and to Native communities. And that sometimes includes honest and uncomfortable dialogue. But since you guys are all here today, I'm sure that you're super comfortable with that. <laughs> um, so what's working? I talked about what's needed. Um, programs that are specific to Native Americans that are sharing um, cultural teachings, um, access to elders, all of those things I mentioned in the last slide, um, Native specific programming, services that are low barrier, um, so some examples for low barrier is not requiring um, or, or not cutting off services to somebody because they're 15 minutes late or um, because they didn't show up to an appointment or having this like uh, three strikes and you're out type of rule. So ensuring that people continue can continue to come back for services for as long as they need, um, regardless of kind of extenuating circumstances. Uh, risk reduction is absolutely something that's working. Um, Safe spaces, again, as mentioned before, safe spaces where we can explore our identity with others who have similar experiences. And then again, that humor and humility. So what can you do? Some different things. Um, if you're working within a program, there can be um, program self-evaluation. So does your program or organization create a safe space for Native clients? Are you or others in your organization cognizant of ways in which your organization participates in systemic oppression? And if so, what action steps are you taking to mitigate the damage? Do you have any Native staff? If not, what active steps are you taking to make this happen? Uh, keep in mind that some hiring policies may need to be changed. Um, if you're working with Native clients, how are you helping to connect them with cultural resources? If you're not aware of cultural resources, um, there are a ton of different options. Um, I'm sure again, you're here right now. You've probably heard of the Indigenous Association. Um, there are a, a few different organizations in the Fargo-Moorhead area that have native specific programming. Um, so, and I'm sure that there may even be some people in attendance right now that can share some information as well. So if you're interested and I'm happy to have conversations around this, otherwise um, reach out to the Indigenous Association. Um, definitely look around to see what else is happening. Um, again, making space, um, engaging in education. So if you don't know a lot about Native American culture, either current or historical, there are also tons of resources. Um, so 
Uh, <laughs> like my brain is a, a gigantic sponge. And at any point in time, I, I feel like maybe we have somebody from the YWCA racial justice committee on the call right now, and they can attest to this. But if at any point in time, you're like, oh, can you tell me what kind of native nonfiction book I should be reading or TV show or movie? Like, I just have this ridiculous list in my head at all points in time. Um, and I'm happy to share that too. So if that's something that you're interested in, like, don't feel free to reach out to me, but also know that um, West Fargo Library, Fargo Library, Moorhead Public Library all have resources and they've all been hosting different events um, specifically with native authors. So like keep an eye out for that as well. And then I also know, I think Zambro's also had something in the past few years with one of my favorite authors who is also indigenous. So many different places where you can reach out to and learn more about this. And again, there may be people that are like listening in right now that have a ton of information here, or again, um, shameless plug for indigenous association. Um, so another thing that's important that each of us and individuals can do um, is better understand our own biases. So regardless of how woke or well-educated we are, we're still enculturated in American society, which has been built on structural oppression. And there are, again, so many resources online uh, and also in our community. We have some super awesome trainers specifically around um, implicit bias, um, all of these different things, people that you can reach out to to learn more about um, and to help us learn what implicit bias is, what biases we may hold, and how we can actively overcome these biases to be better providers, better neighbors, and better citizens. So um, look out for that information. And then I wanna share too, every training I give, specifically in regards to racial disparities in the Native experience, I include the same quote because I am a broken record, and it's from the Talmud, and it's, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. So the weight of the world often feels like it's upon our shoulders. The lens in which we view this world can also often differ based on our own separate and very different life experiences. Um, so sometimes asking us to speak on behalf of our tribe or one of the 700, sorry, 574 recognized tribes adds to that weight. So don't be afraid to ask us questions, but also recognize that it's not on us as Native folks to provide all of the education. So there are so many different options and resources out there in order for you to learn more about this. <laughs> and as it is Indigenous Peoples Day, I'm sure there's tons across all of your social media feeds. Um, if you're on Instagram, I follow like 10 million different pages and I would love to share them all with you. If you're on Facebook, again, shameless plug for Indigenous Association. Um, but there are just so many different places out there where you can learn more about the Native experience without overburdening a Native American individual. So other ways, um, as I had mentioned, how can you support Indigenous pr protective factors, uh, whether that is as an individual, um, as a community member, as a, as a service provider. So allow access to ancestral and cultural teachings. And what does that look like? Are there these opportunities in this community? Absolutely yes. Can we make more opportunities for this to happen within our Fargo-Moorhead community? Absolutely yes. If you're in an organization, can you bring in an elder to come and speak to the to the folks that you serve or to come in and speak to your um, <clears throat> to your staff to, to talk about why is this important to talk about what our clients need? Um, can you allow connection to spirituality, self and community? Um, how, how do you do that for the families that you serve or that you um, interact with on a regular basis? How can we? continue to to uphold this and create more opportunities for this? Is this something that you maybe can help fund? Is this something that you can help sponsor? Maybe you're really great at creating events and you can put something together to really create a, a community activity. Um, and then also it's super important to note that um, as tribal people, when you're creating these opportunities, you should be keeping the whole family in mind when we're talking about this, because we really want to um, uphold and uplift 
Native communities as a whole, and that includes trying to create space to create or to um, rebuild strong family support systems. So if you're inviting Native youth, make an opportunity for that to be something that parents, grandparents, cousins, aunties, uncles can participate in as well. Um, again, creating space for or um, having respect for or making re referrals for traditional medicine and healing for trauma and substance abuse. Um, I talk about specifically destigmatization, de and I'm just going to share this really short story. I'm running low on time. I have had the super, <laughs> the coolest opportunity on the planet. I participated in something called the Human Trafficking Leadership Academy, which is funded um, through the federal program Office of Trafficking in Persons. And this leadership program that I participated in was specifically on how culture can be used as a protect protective factor against trafficking among Indigenous youth. And one of the other participants in there is a survivor of trafficking. Um, she grew up on a reservation on the East Coast, and um, she experienced sex trafficking as a 13-year-old girl um, and was trafficked between the ages of 13 and 18. She was in uh, the child welfare system, met a trafficker, and um, was away from her reservation for that period of time while she was trafficked. She returned home to the, to the reservation after escaping her trafficker as a young adult, and um, was immediately ostracized by her entire home community. Um, she was not accepted. She was made to feel ashamed. Um, they did not see her as a victim of trafficking. They saw her um, in a negative light, quote unquote, prostitute, um, which is a topic for another day, but is definitely not a positive thing and shouldn't be language that we're using to talk about people who experience sexual exploitation um, and survival sex. But anyways, she was received with this, this um, ostracization and really, really negative community uh, view of her. And she reported that, you know, all of this trauma that she experienced at the hand of her trafficker was really just amplified by the shame and stigmatization that her tribal community received her with. And she struggled with substance abuse for many, many years afterwards and really struggled with her identi identity. So we really need to, as individuals and community members, work hard to destigmatize on the shame around experiencing victimization as um, sex trafficking survivors, as labor trafficking survivors, as folks who have experienced sexual exploitation. And then finally, allowing survivors the opportunity to lead programming, to talk about specifically what they need um, from programs, from community members, from communities as a whole. And then um, just a, like a laundry list of different ways that we can support, and I giggle about this again, because as I mentioned before, my brain is a sponge and there are just a million different things. Like I could probably talk about this slide for the next 45 minutes, but we don't have that. Um, so there are just a couple of different ideas in which we as uh, providers, individuals and community members can support um, physical, emotional, spiritual and mental wellness. Um, through an indigenous lens and I'm just going to kind of like laundry list them for you all. So, like traditional activities, basketball, mind, body, medicine, sweats, um, Medeoan for Anishinaabe youth, um, attending powwow, dancing, um, drum groups, sobriety feasts. I, I think I said sobriety powwows. Um, native led specific healing groups, um, beading, sewing, creating ribbon skirts, shawls, jingle dresses, vests, more, um, moccasins, uh, drum making, hosting winter events where elders can share traditional stories, uh, traditional healers, traditional medicines, sage, tobacco, sweet, sweet grass, cedar, traditional foods and food sovereignty. Um, <laughs> So that's not fry bread, y'all. Fry bread is delicious, but that's also not our traditional food. Um, native films and TV shows, smoke signals, powwow highway, basketball or nothing. Um, reservation dogs, also positive, also sad. Um, so just as a reminder too, like if you're looking at native films or native shows to show to kids or communities, um, vet them before showing them to youth. I just want to know, um, want you guys to know that Wind River is not an indigenous story. So that's my little um, rant. I'm um, providing access to Native American adults in the community. Um, also, this can be vetting. Vetting can be helpful here, but what's really important specifically for indigenous youth is to have access to adults, 
from all different walks of life. So they don't have to be visible in the community as activists, but could be business professionals, professors, educators, healers, DV advocates, scientists. Um, show them that we as Indigenous people can be anything. And then finally, encouraging family participation. Um, let's see. I don't know that we have enough time to talk about this. I, I just recognizing that if you are in an organization and you're trying to build relationships with tribal partners, um, just some things to be aware of. So that recognition, as I'd mentioned, of historical issues, um, listening to the needs of tribal partners or tribal community members versus determining them without asking questions. Um, show up, show up to tribal activities, come to different things that we're hosting in the community. Um, recognize that building trust should be something that's done on a long term basis versus um, identifying and responding to a short term need and uh, reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out to your tribal partners and ask questions again, as I had mentioned, sometimes those questions can be answered. Um, via Google, so <laughs> it's this delicate balance, right? And maybe it's something you want to Google before you ask a partner or a friend even. Um, and if you can't find the answer in Google, or you can at least say, hmm, what's a, a better way that I can ask this? How can I ask this respectfully without burdening someone in my life? Um, and that brings us to the conclusion. Um, I just kind of wanted to take a moment to share that I liked to choose imagery in these trainings that um, either represent the beauty in nature in Minnesota or in North Dakota around us or specifically the beauty of indigenous people. So um, that brings us here. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions. I just have a few minutes left. I'm super into any questions you may have. And if you would like to also, I'm going to share my email. Oops, that's not it. So sorry, guys. Dang it. I guess my email is at the beginning. So I will share my email and chat. And if you're interested in like learning more about any of this stuff, I have like 10 million resources. I have a referral page as well. So super happy to have conversations with people always. <laughs>